Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the webinar this evening. We have myself, um, Kevin Allen, uh, Scott Pecken, as well as David Orban um, online tonight. Tonight, we're going to be uh, having a discussion around with the rise of technology adoption, what are the options going to be given that uh, uh, ro uh, robotics and AI are, are potentially going to be taking jobs? What, what are we going to do as a society? And this is something I know David is very passionate about. And so we're going to be chatting about that this evening. But before we get going, on my next slide, you'll see that I just wanted to let everybody know who is with us this evening and who who is um, who's well, listening uh, Kevin, in. Just, Kevin, Kevin, just quickly, do you want me to drive the slides? Will you just tell me which slide you want to go to? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's just the next slide. I, I, I'm, no, I'm not sure. That's fine, no problem. So this evening, the the once again, in terms of Scott, we can, yeah, there we go. In terms of the user, the, the folks on tonight, you'll see once again, in terms of blockchain expertise, uh, there are a lot of newcomers once again. So welcome. It's really great to have you, uh, as well as those who participated in token sales. And then just the map here, just reminding us of where everyone's from tonight. We, we got 14 different countries, which is, which is really exciting. Um, so tonight, of course, we have David Orban, and just to introduce um, David and to to get the webinar kicked off, we're just going to I'm going to hand over to Scott, who's going to introduce David and just give a brief introduction around tonight's topic. So over to you, Scott. Yeah, thank you very much, Kevin. So uh, David, welcome. It's, as always, it's a pleasure to have you online. And for those who don't know, you know, David was one of the first investors in Ether. You know, he's a venture capitalist. His company is called Network Society Ventures, where they specialize in exponential technologies, blockchain, and, and the crypto environment. And I'll let him tell you more about that. He's a faculty member of Singularity University and a global authority in blockchain and crypto in terms of what is actually happening. If, uh, if you enjoyed tonight's webinar, there's another one uh, next week on the 14th of March, which is, is blockchain going to change the world? You know, it's becoming, I got a fascinating article, which I'll put in the chat box for people. And also, if you're watching the recording down below from Inc. Magazine on the nine industries going to be most affected by blockchain. And then we're actually off, Kevin, myself and David are all off to Puerto Rico next uh, week, which is becoming one of the crypto capitals of the world. And we both uh, are speaking at Blockchain Unbound and also Coin Agenda Caribbean. And then um, I managed, uh, Kevin and I managed to persuade uh, da uh, David to come to, to Africa. And there's one thing the rest of the world doesn't have, which is game reserves with a big five. So that was, uh, that was the way to, to make this happen. But uh, we're very excited. We've got our FinTech events, which are happening on the 24th of March in Johannesburg, the 27th of March in Cape Town, and the 28th of March in Durban, where we'll be looking at basically blockchain technology, exponential technology, cryptocurrencies. We've got David Orban. We've got Willem van der Post, uh, myself, and, and other people that are really specializing in the space. And... If you want to know anything around uh, the fintech and where it's going, and particularly blockchain and cryptocurrencies, then this is not something you can afford to miss. And then for our wealth partners, we're very excited, you know, to have private dinners uh, with David and, and his wife, and my wife will be there as well in Johannesburg on the 24th of March, so in the evening after the event. In Cape Town, it's the night before, so it's uh, 26th of March, and in Durban, it's the night after the event, the 28th of March. So make sure those are in your diaries. Those are for wealth partners only and are, you know, um, um, private, basically. Just a quick one in terms of a lead into the topic David was talking about tonight. You know, Ray Kurzweil is one of the most respected people in the world in artificial intelligence and also predicting where the future goes. He's got an accuracy of over 80% over the last 30 years of predicting technology. And something I learned from him when I went to Singularity, you know, not as a, not as a lecturer, but as a, as a, as a graduate, uh, he basically said you've got to look for major trends that are intersecting, and that's how you can spot the future. And, you know, when, when people look at, at their lives, they, they think that life is so predictable, and they think of it in a linear way, and they don't understand the exponential changes that are happening in technology and ultimately what that means in terms of where their life is going to 
to end up. And what we look at is that there's some major changes happening around the world. The first one is economic change. People want to be in control of their own destiny now. They've had enough of, of, of what they've been taught, you know, in the 20th century by the uh, governments and, and the institutional, the financial institutions. There's also social forces. People are coming together, the power of the crowd. You know, if you look at the women's movement in America at the moment, it's, it's absolutely massive with what I do. I do. Um, I do as well. I, well, I do. What, what's it? I do or whatever. And then technology and all the Me too. Sorry, me too. And then all the technology changes and, and you know, we'll get into that. Tonight. But all these three major forces actually culminate in eight major trends. You know, you've got gamification and learning, which is fundamentally changing education. You've got blockchain and cryptocurrencies, which are increasing trust and reducing friction costs. You've got social commerce and collaborative investing, which are increasing returns and reducing risk. You've got personalization. You know, people are no longer interested in having any health plan. They want their personalized path to health. You know, people don't just want any sort of uh, investment, you know, plan. They want their personalized plan to wealth, and they want to have a meaningful connection with their investments. The, you know, around the world, the middle class is, I was uh, being interviewed today by a New York uh, journalist, and the middle class is want, you know, wanting the same needs, and there's 3 billion people that are coming, you know, from the unbanked over the next uh, 5 to 10 years. And between the 1.2 million, sorry, 1.2 billion people joining the middle class and the 3 billion people joining the global economy, there's massive rise of, of people's needs. There's globalization and local volatility, whether we talk about people wanting to diversify across countries, assets or currencies, it's no longer just for the top 1%. Everybody wants it. There's social pressure to democratize the access to wealth and ultimately power the 99%. And then finally, investors are wanting to have a purposeful impact. They don't want to just invest. They want to co-create the planet that they want to see and be part of. And we believe that all these eight trends are actually culminating and we believe that they're going to intersect around 2020. And when you hear me talk about how I believe we can empower a billion people by 2020, a lot of people think that we're in 2018 and we start staring mad. I say to you, watch this future because when massive trends intersect, it's where opportunity lies. And why is it so important? And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. You know, a study by Credit Suisse came out in October last year that literally the top 1% and now own over 50%. If you want to be exact, it's 0.7% of the, the top 0.7% own more than 50% of the world's wealth. You know, depending on where you live, if you lived in Australia, Japan, North America, or Europe, then you're fine. But if you live anywhere else, then you then you, you know, effectively got inequality against you. If you're a woman, less than 10% of billionaires are women. And I've read reports anywhere as low as 1%, that less than 1% of the world's wealth is actually owned by, by women. And then if you're a millennial, well, unfortunately for you, you know, you were just born in the wrong time. And without further ado, that really brings me, you know, on to David tonight and the topic he wants to share us, you know, with us, because we talk about artificial intelligence. We talk about exponential technologies. There's already a massive problem with regards to the wealth gap and income inequality. And what is going to happen in the world once technology really starts to have an impact, once artificial intelligence comes in? When I was at Singularity University, they were talking of unemployment in Africa being over 80% in China being over 85%. What do we do? You know, is it just the wealthy get wealthier? You know, do we support people with, with money for doing nothing? You know, do we take money from the artificial intelligence companies? What do we do? And, you know, I really have a huge amount of honor to, to welcome David because he's a global authority in the space and, and, you know, spends more time on an airplane than, than anywhere else in the world at the moment because he's been sharing with people from all over the world as to how do we solve this problem. And so I want to hand over to you, David. I'm just going to change the presenter over so that um, I can give you your screen. So uh, you should be able to accept now. And um, it's all yours. Thank you very much. And uh, it is uh, really wonderful to be uh, together. Uh, actually, uh, it, uh, it has been a, a little bit of a, of a close um, uh, I, I just landed with the plane, as you, as you said. I, I, I live a little bit on, on airplanes, and it was late taking off. And, and uh, luckily, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is not uh, uh, too late to, to be together with you. So um, I, I believe you are seeing uh, my slides. Please confirm that uh, that is the case. Yep, we got you clearly. We can hear you and see you clearly. And, and, and you see the slides as well? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So uh, as, as you said, uh, Scott, uh, technology is really uh, changing the world. 
And uh, my uh, point of view is that uh, um, what we are seeing and experiencing in our lives through personal computers and mobile phones and smartphones and now the forthcoming Internet of Things uh, is a true coevolution of humanity with technology that has been going on for thousands of years or tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and as we moved from the pyramids to the Middle Ages uh, in our industrial society, and now we are laying the infrastructure of a new kind of global civilization where um, communications uh, across continents and the flow of ideas uh, really enable uh, not only restoring uh, our ability to understand the world, but augmenting what uh, humanity is capable of, we are now looking at the possibility of an understanding uh, of the world uh, that is an unprecedented scale uh, in terms of how we uh, map the world uh, in a fine granularity, and how we are able to explore um, in a manner that really resembles an evolutionary process uh, the path for uh, resilient and sustainable communities and societies. Um, the reason I say this is unprecedented is because it has been happening previously too, but just like 99% uh, of the species in biological evolution have perished. 99% um, of the empires and societies succumbed uh, in the past. Uh, and uh, this happened through an incredibly blunt instrument of war and violent conflict. Um, we have been, of course, quite good in designing uh, hierarchical and centralized organizations that uh, uh, aimed at um, telling a given group of people what to do. Uh, if you were uh, in Egypt during the, 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 the age of the pharaohs, well, that was the pharaoh telling everybody else what to do. Uh, if you are uh, in the age uh, of uh, um, the corporate man, uh, 50s and 60s in the United States, uh, typically, as it is described, then it is the CEO telling you what to do, uh, totally top-down with very little degree of freedom for emancipation and empowerment uh, uh, on the individual level. But there are people who see, like I do, that today an alternative is emerging of distributed and decentralized organizations that uh, are constituted by individuals who are informed uh, about what is going on, about uh, uh, how they can design their lives and their communities, how can they feel uh, empowered by a future that they understand, that they can decode. This is not a future that is um, uh, to them uh, um, totally uh, clear with, with uh, no degree of uncertainty. It's not that they uh, see everything and, and uh, uh, they are all-knowing. Uh, but it is a future that uh, uh, they can um, uh, modulate uh, through their actions and their dreams that become reality. Now, I am not alone uh, believing in this. Uh, Peter Diamandis is uh, a co-founder of Singularity University uh, and, and he also feels that technology is the fundamental driving factor in social change. And Fred Wilson, who is a very well-known uh, investor in New York, uh, also uh, believes that uh, uh, bureaucratic hierarchies are being replaced by nimbler and uh, more adaptable networks. Ray Kurzweil, who you uh, also quoted, uh, Scott, extends this to uh, very powerful future technologies like artificial intelligence that he believes will fulfill their potential 
through decentralization and, and uh, being distributed. So I summarize this in what I call the fundamental thesis of uh, the network society, that widespread social and economic change only happens once a solid technological foundation evolves to make it sustainable. And that today we do see globally distributed and decentralized technologies that have emerged achieving superior results with respect to centralized and hierarchical ones. And in conclusion, as a consequence, that these unstoppable technologies are going to fundamentally change uh, the supporting pillars of what is today the nation state, leading to a new phase transformation in our socio-economic organization that I call the network society. And uh, for those of you uh, in honor of uh, South Africa, uh, who uh, speaks Zulu, here it is in, uh, in Zulu, uh, as well as uh, in Afrikaans. And uh, I am very grateful uh, for Kevin's help and, and those who uh, he asked uh, to, to, to double check. Uh, I don't speak either. Uh, and uh, and uh, we have uh, the fundamental thesis of the Network Society translated in dozens and dozens of different languages from uh, Arabic to Chinese uh, to uh, Maori uh, and, and, and so on and so forth because um, we believe that this is a, a, a change that is happening all over the world. And it is happening across several industries, whether it is solar energy, 3D printing and digital manufacturing, hydroponics and cultivated meat, personalized health, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, we look at blockchain and Bitcoin as part of a broad and deep movement towards decentralization of a technology that finance itself represents, a very important one. Trust networks that enable us to um, uh, design inclusive participation that is not based on the paradigm of conflict and violence. And the challenge, really, of a new type of governance, policymaking, and regulatory frameworks that are well equipped to uh, face the challenges of the 21st century civilization, as well as are able to be um, measured and updated with the speed that the adaptability of rapidly changing technologies uh, requires. So I think that uh, as you look at the context, uh, it is clear that this uh, is unstoppable uh, transformation. Uh, it is not a fad. It is not a technological hype that is driving it. It is not a question of where we are on the Gartner hype cycle and, and what a given analyst is going to say or not say. Um, we are, uh, we, we, we necessitate to understand uh, what the toolbox of uh, knowledge and, and behaviors uh, we can use to uh, really leverage uh, this, uh, this change. Because the new organizations that are going to emerge are incredibly empowering and emancipating uh, to people in an inclusive manner. Everybody can experiment uh, and learn how to cope uh, with these new approaches and uh, to acquire dignity uh, as they go through their lives in the knowledge that they participate in a resilient community uh, abandoning the cages of old type of thinking and understanding that there are zero barriers for actively participating in this change. That is why we think that learning and teaching about uh, what is going on around the world is, is so important. And we have the privilege that uh, this uh, supercomputer that all of us have in our pockets is a window to these worlds of opportunities. And participating in these opportunities is a single thing.
finger tap away for anybody and and everybody this is how the new uh, rapidly evolving business models are being born this is what is for me very exciting both as an investor as well as a designer of uh, futures that i hope uh, you will agree uh, are laying the ground for uh, incredible opportunities for billions of people around the world thank you very much so this was my a uh, short uh, preamble for uh, opening really a conversation uh, with the, our attendees and of course with you Scott and Kevin I'm really looking forward to, to what will emerge because the themes that you have introduced are incredibly um, stimulating and of course are a fundamental challenge that our civilization is facing so let's start, let's start, you know, before I sort of get into the wealthy coin and some of the stuff that we've got around that, let's start with a conversation around this universal basic income. And, you know, I can't remember the exact stats. I can go back and look for the photo when I was at Singularity two, it was pretty much two years ago. And what I, what I thought it was that, you know, things like artificial intelligence were going to affect the first world more than the emerging world, you know, and that was my, rightly or wrongly, that was just my, my belief system. Then when I looked at the numbers, it was Africa and Asia and China and South Africa that, you know, I can't remember the number with South Africa, but I, I remember it either being 80% or 85% was the expected number of jobs that were going to get removed by artificial intelligence. And obviously everyone's now terrified because, you know, you know, we've already, we've already got sort of 30% unemployment in South Africa and, you know, there's plenty of problems around the world. Where do you see this going, David, in terms of technology changing society? And it's happened many times before, you know, when, when, when the electric engines came along and industrialization, everyone thought all the farm workers were going to be out of work. You know, what, what's your thoughts on, uh, on, on where the future is going over the next 10 to 20 years? Um, we have to realize that the social um, contract is not a natural law. So what we believe today uh, to be the basis of how we live together is just the consequence of a given series of technologies and of a given shared agreement of, of a design that we accept. Uh, and, you know, a few hundred years ago, or even more recently for, for some societies, that, for example, included slavery or, or child labor. It was perfectly fine uh, in uh, the mid-1800s uh, in, in England uh, for gentlemen to argue that it would be horrible to outlaw child labor because the productivity of coal mines would plummet and that it was better to have children of 8, 10 or 12 years old spend uh, 10 hours in the coal mines because the economic consequences uh, would be would be unsufferable if they didn't. Now, um, today's syllogism that if you work uh, you have a value to society, which is measured in your salary. And if you don't work, your value to society uh, in terms of your economic output is zero. And as a consequence, you don't deserve to be considered the worthy member of society is, in my view, as horrible as uh, being told somebody that uh, he or she is a piece of property and can be bought and sold or that uh, children should be working in coal mines uh, 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 on, on hours uh, on end. Uh, but I also understand those who come back and say, well, but uh, how can it be that you are paid if you do nothing? So one important thing is that nobody has a solution yet. <laughs> also, we will find a solution. Absolutely, it is guaranteed there will be a solution. What is very important is to go from here to there, minimizing human suffering. Because in the past, uh, we knew so little about what was happening around the world that there are incredible tragedies with millions of people dying of famine or war that we know very little about because we didn't have the chance of learning about them. Today, we do. We cannot wash our hands. 
we cannot say, oh, that is Mao in China who is crazy. So tens of millions of uh, Chinamen are dying and I don't care. It is, it is not something that we can afford anymore. So we have the responsibility of experimenting as much as we can with various solutions, measuring and rapidly learning from each other across the globe uh, until we find some solutions. You mentioned artificial intelligence. Um, my, one of my messages is, our enemies are not the smart machines. We have a common enemy among people and smart machines, and those are the dumb machines. <laughs> Let's take a simple case of uh, automobiles. The um, Minister of Transportation in India declared that they will never allow self-driving cars uh, to, uh, uh, to spread around India because uh, that would mean that the tuk-tuk drivers uh, uh, lose their jobs and they have to think about the tuk-tuk drivers. Now, unfortunately, apparently, what they are not thinking about is the tens of thousands of Indians who are dying of car accidents every year who would not be di dying if uh, uh, self-driving cars uh, uh, got widespread. There are 1.3 million people dying every year in car accidents and many more millions being permanently disabled in car accidents. Isn't that just by itself an incredible example of why we should embrace artificial intelligence as rapidly as we can in order to increase human flourishing rather than maximize the um, static support system of an incumbent social contract that is myopic to human suffering. So um, that is that is my my opening salvo around uh, around that uh, Scott. So tell me in terms of you know I was fascinated when I was in Davos and you gave a presentation you know because a lot of people don't really actually quite frankly in my opinion understand inc income equal inequality and then you know they, they tend to go yeah well we need un you know universal basic income and i try and say sort of sweden you know has done it and norway's done it and there's been successes but you actually had a far better solution not only using technology but but on how we can kind of go but based on value you know yeah. there, there's a little bit of linguistic uh, hacking around this uh, in order to reprogram people's uh, minds. You know, uh, when we talk about the ultra wealthy, uh, what we accuse them of is to be parasites of society uh, uh, implementing an aristocratic feudal rentier uh, uh, system where without doing anything, they benefit from, from society. And isn't it paradoxical that when somebody says, well, maybe society now is rich enough to extend that kind of living to others, we accuse that experiment of creating people who are lazy because they would benefit from society without working. Now, what I propose, the linguistic hack, is rather than talking about universal basic income, which triggers this kind of... Um, uh, syllogism in people's minds, you work, you earn, you don't er work, you don't earn an income, is to call what part of the forthcoming solution could be uh, in how society reorganizes itself, universal basic wealth. Because wealth coming from uh, your assets and coming from uh, the, the property that, that you have of various kinds, whether it is stock, real estate, uh, or, or other things, people understand that those have a yield and that this yield generates uh, the ability, the economic ability to spend and spending without actually exhausting the source of that. Uh, I believe that human existence 
itself in the future will be recognized as a source of wealth. By sheer being a member of society, you will be recognized to be worth to society unconditionally. And of course, that doesn't mean that everything is possible to anybody. Uh, I want to go to Mars. Well, that is going to be a scarce uh, opportunity for sure. Not billions of people will not go to Mars. Uh, I want to have uh, an apartment in Manhattan. Well, I may not be uh, owning an apartment in Manhattan. Um, at least not uh, all of it. Maybe I will own a fraction of one. Uh, uh, and I will generate some uh, wealth through that uh, that fraction. And, 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 and once you are uh, aware uh, of, of this uh, different kind of thinking that really overcomes uh, the objections of a lot of people, understanding how we can build more inclusive solutions to the challenges that we have uh, in, in front of us. And um, uh, we have to really, uh, I think, understand the asteroid that is going to kill us all is there, already coming. The only difference between the dinosaurs and us is that they didn't have telescopes. We have no idea how to stop it. The only thing we can do is to apply our human ingenuity to find a solution. Do I know who is it that is going to find the solution? I have no idea. That is why I want to empower anybody and everybody to work on what really matters in order to keep the experiment of human civilization going. And, and only if we can educate everybody, we can give health to everybody, if we can give opportunities to everybody to follow their talents and their potential, that is when we can aim to address these challenges. The asteroid, for sure, and many others. <laughs> That's interesting, you, you speak of that, and um, I, uh, I wanted to share with you uh, uh, my screen here. So I'm not sure how much you're aware of what's happening in South Africa from a political perspective. You know, there's been a, a, new, a new government, a new leader and everything else. But what's fascinating is that one of the greatest challenges you've got in Africa is, quite frankly, what's happened in North America, it's happened in Australia, where there's land redistribution. And, and in many ways, they talk about, you know, righting the wrongs of the past. Now, the challenge you've got in Africa is that they want to do land redistribution but they want to do it without compensation because they don't have any money to buy the land at market value prices. And when you take Zimbabwe, you know, they, they ran probably the most successful economy. In 1999, it was the most successful economy in Africa. And by 2001, it was the worst performing economy in the world because they took away land rights. Okay, And I, I will share with you another link on why land is so valuable uh, just now. But my point being is that uh, why this is very important, David, is I actually wrote a letter last week and I said to our president and to a guy called Mr. Malema, and I said, listen, guys, you know, it's, it's very much that Einstein's principle. If you think about a problem with the same level of thinking that created the problem, you're not going to find a solution. And what I was trying to say here is that if you just take away a farm and, you know, in the middle of in the country and you effectively just give it to someone that's never productively run a farm, you're not going to create any wealth for them. It's a complete fallacy and a waste of time. Whereas if I understand what you're saying and you take a piece of an income producing asset, something that normally the top 1% would invest in, and you give them access to those opportunities, then they are going to get true wealth, they're going to get an income from their assets, and ultimately it's going to give them a far better quality of life. And you know, you could take, you could take public enterprise projects like desalinization plants or airports or infrastructure or anything. And my point being is that you know, this for me is, is, is one of the ways that technology can ultimately solve some of the greatest challenges we have. But if people keep thinking about solving problems with effectively a linear local mindset, you know, which we you know brought up over 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 decades and centuries, we're never going to solve anything. And um, yeah, it's, I, I suppose I'm just trying to put a real life context to to some of the stuff you've been talking about. Um, I will refrain from commenting on the uh, local political uh, situation because 
uh, it would be uh, totally un uneducated and, and, and inelegant. Uh, however, uh, to put it in a broader context, um, the pressure on our current political system, including the regulatory and policymaking uh, support systems, is incredible because they were born under the premise that a certain type of planning will enable them to know what is going to happen. And today, um, so many things are changing so rapidly altogether that this is totally impossible. But still, they don't feel that they are in the position of saying, well, we don't know because they would be immediately replaced by another group who pretends to know without knowing, right? So we have really to learn from uh, some of the lessons of one of the most successful um, areas of the world in, in, in its capacity to create uh, wealth, which is Silicon Valley, where they understand that rapidly iterating on imperfect solutions towards a sustainable new model um, can uh, navigate uh, uh, to, 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 to solutions that, that can be found, right? Rather than pretending that right from the start, you know, and that is going to be uh, it. Um, it. It requires, uh, paradoxically, a higher degree of self-confidence to say, I don't know to say this is an experiment and we will measure what's happening and then apply it more broadly or change it, etc. Those people who say that they know and they have the answers are often hiding a weakness and, and, and a confusion uh, that they don't think they can afford to... Uh, to uh, We lost David. No. So, David, a question, a question for everyone that's online. You know, it's one of those things that um, everyone out there is, is sitting thinking, okay, well, you know, we need to make sure the world's okay and et cetera, et cetera. But I guarantee you that every single person is sitting there with this little thing in the back of their head going, you know, what's in it for me? What, what do I do, you know, in terms of, and if you, if you were to say, you know, over the next 10 to 20 years, what do people do? not only for themselves, but for, for you know, their, their families and their loved ones. I mean, it's all good and well to try and, you know, save the world, but, but how do you, you know, look after number one first? You know, what, what do you think with where technology is going and how do people prepare not only to be able to survive in the future, but to be able to thrive? Um, 50 years ago, 60, 70 years ago, um, when um, in, in the U.S., for example, you would come back from war, uh, you would get uh, some level of uh, um, government support to pay for your education. And then with that piece of paper, you would be able to get a job that you would do from then until you retired. And then after retirement, you would, write, you would die um, conveniently fast. Um, then... In the 80s, um, as companies restructured in order to embrace uh, uh, the kind of change that was needed, because they felt that uh, uh, um, their middle management uh, wasn't ready and, and uh, they wanted a new type of resource, uh, rather than letting everybody off, they would say to the, to the most... Uh, uh, dynamic of, of their workforce. Uh, listen, you are in your 40s or 50s. Why don't you retrain for this new kind of job? And then after that, uh, we will rehire you in a given position corresponding to the new skills that you got. And then you will go after that uh, until you retire. And then maybe you will still die conveniently rapidly after retiring. What is happening today is, is the coming together of, of uh, the, 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 the changes of all of these parameters. Um, everybody understands 
that the half-life of new skills is shortening. If it was correct that what you learned would last for, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, 50 years ago, today, on these shelves somewhere behind me, I have a book, five, 600 pages called the Microsoft Windows NT Server 3.0 Bible. <laughs> and I have another volume saying Microsoft Windows Server NT 3.51 Bible. Now, I've read both of those, and I can assure you that the applicability of that knowledge is practically zero, right? The second thing that happened in the meantime is that people live longer and longer and longer, which is a great thing. I hope nobody says, oh my God, that's so bad. Let's keep people dying fast. Um, I mean, and, you joke, and uh, sorry, David, you joke. I've been at a live event where someone said, no, only the, only the people that are on a value to society must die first. <laughs> like I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I cannot, I really cannot comment on that. I, 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 I don't know how, how I would engage uh, somebody, somebody like that. Anyway, um, you know, there, there are, there are actually, just to, just to follow on that comment, there are uh, fundamentalist ecologists who do maintain that an earth without humanity would be better and and they would like a hundred percent of the people to vanish <laughs> there are ecologists who are fundamentalist to a lesser degree they just say we should return to a natural state whatever that means well what it means is that rather than being seven eight billion people on the world there would be seven eight million people in the world and my question to them are you ready to decide who are the 999 out of a thousand who should die? Because I'm not ready to say that. And mm -hmm. I don't think anybody should have the power to say that, which means that there is no way that we are going to ever return back to that supposed natural state of things, which, by the way, meant that you started to have your first children at age 14 or 15, and at age 25 or 30, you would die, and then they would start reproducing. Um, back to, back to uh, what I was um, saying, uh, the, well, not the solution, because we don't have guarantees. Uh, we, we only have the pleasure of an effort that we are honestly making in order to search for solutions. There's no guarantee that we will find the solutions. You know, just like in financial documentations, past performance is no guarantee for future performance. Human civilization has been able to do what it did, but will it succeed in the 21st or 22nd or 23rd century? We have no idea. But we can be proud of what we did and what we want to do, vaccinations, um, in going to space, uh, e education, human rights. These are things that we cannot take for granted. These are huge achievements of human civilization. So what can people do who want to think about their own, um, not only survival, but uh, uh, thriving and 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 uh, opportunities and growing economically, personally, and for their families. Well, participating in a webinar like this is a great first step. Anybody who is here has taken a step to be an active citizen of the twenty first century. Learn about opportunities. Take the first step. I have hundreds of people, probably thousands, who come to tell me, 
oh my god david you've been talking about this bitcoin thing for so long but now it is ten dollars it's too late to get into bitcoin right and then they would come back maybe not the same people but some other people to say oh my god david now bitcoin is a hundred it's too late right bitcoin is now a thousand it's too late right bitcoin is now ten thousand it's too late right it, to take action is never too late to realize that the only thing holding you back is yourself is never too late so that is what people have to do take action experiment uh, own their lives to realize that they are not powerless they are not passive society is not holding them back they have the power of taking action so the last question from my side and then i've got a couple of slides i'd like to share and, and you know people want to open you know my suggestions we open up the floor to questions so please uh, fire them through. I don't know, Kevin, if you've got questions, but if people want to fire them through. But last question from my side, David, and then um, I'll I'll share a couple of slides, and then we'll go back to the to everyone that's online with with uh, with questions. The question I've got, I've got a five year old son. Uh, actually, I lie; he's just turned six. Um, he, he's he's six and one week old. You know, it's one thing you know for me to take action, or or for the other people on this webinar to take action. But you know, for your children, I know you've got a number of children. You know, what is the best advice we can give to them? To prepare for this changing world you know because universal basic income to some extent in my opinion is a slightly negative thing you know people people thrive on on autonomy and and growth and and uh you know living their purpose and you know i don't really fully understand what you know universal basic income if someone doesn't have a purpose you know so what how do we how do we empower the children to to be able to set themselves up for success going into the into this new age um desperation is certainly uh, um, a situation that spurs a lot of people to uh, action right but that doesn't mean that in order to spur people to action you have to turn them into desperate individuals so uh children need challenges they need opportunities they need to see that there's so much to do that is another fallacy that uh, that uh, uh, those who speak about universal basic income, in my opinion, fall into so easily. Oh, everybody will be just couch potatoes. Well, no, no, not at all. We already have a lot of couch potatoes who have been reduced into that position of powerlessness and exploitation by society, which is happy to have them just watch TV all day and buy the um, useless goods that we produce, uh, that we want them to consume, and then keep that cycle going. As long as they don't have opinions, they are easily manipulated, that the latest demagogical, uh, exploitative, uh, populist party can leverage in order to gain power and tell them what to do, uh, uh, keeping them obedient, right? So teaching children that uh, they have an unbounded uh, set of, of challenges that they can face, whether it is, um, you know, curing cancer, whether it is eliminating poverty, whether it is solving the water crisis in Cape Town, whether it is uh, um, going to Mars, uh, whether it is saving the ecosystems, whether it is turning back climate change, there is so much. And I cannot wait to have their passion and creativity augmented by artificial intelligence and robots, because then we will be able to do so much more. And, and uh, you know, I, I have three uh, children, 28, 24 and 18 and and they have all chosen non standard uh, paths uh, in term of education and 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 also uh, working uh, conditions uh, and of course the the youngest is is still uh, searching well as well as everybody else I mean I don't know what I want to do when I grow up if you ask me right but uh, what all of them share 
is uh, a platform for self-expression, uh, self-realization, and my support for doing so uh, with the resources I can give them and that the societies that we want to build and participate in can give them as well. So self-confidence is, I think, the most important step that, that children can receive from parents, support and self-confidence to search for uh, challenges that are worthy of their passion. Can I share something with you quickly, David, which I, uh, I, I actually uh, bought when I was at Singularity University. Um, uh, well, I can't remember if it was that or A360, which is also Peter Diamante's thing. But this is a, a robot that basically is, is uh, in, at our house. My, my wife's run out of the bedroom so that I didn't get her live on a webinar. But um, in simple terms, I can drive this all around. And um, you can imagine for my son, he absolutely loves this, which is effectively a driving uh, iPad. And um, all, I'm, all I'm basically trying to say to people is that this is very good for daddy to play, but it's also incredibly good for him to be playing with technology. So whether it's this or the drone or whatever, you know, I am, I'm always a big believer in, uh, in, in, in exposing them to these technologies as well. So self-confidence, I completely agree with you. I think it's the most important commodity. But why, that, don't I, why, don't I do, why don't I do the same showing you around a little bit? Uh, here is my, my dog keeping me company while I'm talking to you all. Here's my fireplace. Uh, I, I'm uh, right now in Italy and it's winter here. And in this corner, uh, you can see uh, under my coat, I just ran in uh, the, the, the house uh, to start the webinar. So I, I left the coat there. Here you can see our 3D printer. And uh, here are the VR goggles and somewhere there is the uh, uh, Bitcoin miner and everything else. Now, some of these are expensive for some of the families, but you don't even need to buy them individually. There are maker spaces everywhere. And if there isn't one, you should just get together with a few dozen people and say, let's do a maker space where you can acquire as a community all these tools and then empower yourselves and your children to learn about the technologies behind these tools that will uh, make them active citizens of our global 21st century civilization. Awesome. Well, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I was a bit of an impromptu thing, but I thought we were talking about children and you know, I uh, like I joked, it's uh, it's in the essence of helping my son, but daddy likes buying, buying all the gadgets as well. So I'm not, <laughs> it's not being around the bush. So um, just quickly in terms of, uh, you know, where these ICOs and everything are going, some of you might or might not have seen this. And um, it's absolutely amazing what has happened. So if you can see on the graph, we're looking at 2014, the year of 2014, and the ICOs that took place. Uh, in 2014, so you can see uh, Ethereum there in 2014, which David was one of the first people to invest in. Now we're going into 2015, and uh, you can sort of see what, what's going on in 2015. Not a huge amount. Um, so, you know, only $38 million in total raised to date. We, we're coming towards the end of 2015, coming into 2016 now. So we're just short of $50 million. And uh, now we're going to 2016. And you can see there's quite a lot more activity starting to come in 2016. We're up to, what's that, nearly $300 million. And now we go into 2017, and now you can start to see why the regulators have got quite excited as well. And I'm sure that uh, since this, uh, since I got this graph, there's been another three months. I'm sure there can be plenty more added to that. So, you know, what I wanted to just share with people was, you know, we've, uh, Kevin and I have had the privilege of spending a lot of time with David and others uh, all over the world. 
and learning. You know, I get asked all the questions all the time at the moment. You know, what do you look for in a successful ICO? I got asked literally today uh, by the New York Times, uh, um, you know, the New York uh, reporter. And uh, for me, really what's come through very clearly is the first one is that people are looking for an existing business, you know, business that's making money. And from our perspective, we've had more than two years now where we've made more than a million dollars uh, net revenue. And this year, we're on track for over $4 million uh, in, in revenue. You know, the second thing is an existing team. And I really believe that this is quite an important one, that if people haven't been entrepreneurs, they don't really know what I'm talking about. You could give someone $100 million. Uh, building a team is very difficult. And that's in good conditions, you know, let alone bad conditions. And, um, you know, from our perspective, our board is something that I'm extremely proud of. You know, for those of you who are wealth partners, you'll know that on Tuesday night, we announced that, um, that Henny would be actually running the investment committee. So being able to focus on the real estate and really continuing to do what he's done. We're about to close. I'm not sure, David, if you even know this. We're closing a deal on the 22nd of March that's over $100 million portfolio. And it's seriously starting to get people's attention, like the, those sort of quantums. Like no crowdfunding site in the world has done a, a deal of those volumes. Plus, it's not buying the deal. It's actually it's I didn't know the deal. That. Pardon? Congratulations. I didn't know that. Yeah. No, no. It's, it's significant. It's really starting to raise eyebrows. And, you know, what we've done also is that Justin has stepped up into chairman of the board and has over 20 years experience in building marketplaces across multiple countries and continents. And really in the, in the stage of business we're in at the moment, it's, it's extremely exciting to have Henny be able to really focus on quality real estate and the whole portfolio strategy and Justin to help us continue with the tech and the marketplace. You know, Martin Freeman and Joyce Scoffler, um, very, very experienced in fintech. Joy's one of the top 10 in, in America in this space. Uh, Paul Nierer is out of Australia, one of the top compliance people in the world. Dr. Dolph DeRus is, is one of the more recognized people in international real estate education. And then these are three of the more respected people in the world when it comes to blockchain and crypto. And we can see David is uh, not only an investor and shareholder, but, but also an advisor uh, to us in terms of where we're going. And, and this is not even mentioning the leadership team and, and the team at large that, that are actually executing and, and uh, with their guidance. And then the third one for me, which is probably the most important, is that there's a lot of great ideas out there. A lot of people are going to change the world and are raising money to do so. But are they really solving a, a massive problem? And you know, I'm listening to a great book at the moment, which I'd highly recommend, called Scrum. And just this morning, I heard a great thing. You know, you basically need to not only solve a great problem, but you also need to understand if it's possible or not. You know, blockchaining every deeds office in the world is a wonderful fantasy, and it's going to happen probably in my lifetime in the next 30 years. But is it going to be easy in the very short term? Not at all. And, and um, you know, so is it possible? It's a question. And the third thing is, how do you make money? How are you actually going? To, who's going to pay for it? You know, what's the problem? And, and what's, you know, who, whose solution are you going to solve? And I think from our perspective, I've already shown you to start off already that the wealth gap is one of the greatest challenges in the world. The middle class is, is there's 1.2 million billion people joining the, the middle class in the next 10 years and another 3 billion joining the rest of uh, the economy. And, and they all want the same solution. And, because of that, our platform, I mean, we've had three times the growth in two months that we had in the entire uh, year of 2016 in terms of members signing up. You know, Kevin's done a wonderful map now where we've got members from 111 countries around the world. We need one person from Greenland, Kevin, because it's a big, big piece of land with, <laughs> with no one on it. But uh, we do need one person from Greenland. And then, um, you know, this, this goes through into our transactions, which, you know, for me is also what gets exciting in. 2015, we did 179 transactions. In 2016, we did 302. In 2017, we did 908. And this year, we've set ourselves a minimum target of, of well over 2,000. And so you can see that, uh, that growth every single year. And our investors now come from 44 countries around the world. So, you know, quite, you know, quite heavily distributed when you consider, you know, there's a lot of people that want to change the world, but there's very few that are actually doing it at a global scale. And then these are the numbers, you know, in terms of what I've just said. So 111 countries, investors from 44, there's, um, we're actually up to $69 million now through the platform. I know this is the number that's in the white paper. Um, we, we've uh, done over 1,800 transactions on the blockchain already, a team of over 60 people. The thing I'm proudest of is that we've you know, got a higher than 70% reinvestment rate, and we've paid out over $4.5 million. And you know, why does this and how does this relate to our, to our ICO? Well, the good news is, and some of you have heard this for a couple of weeks now, but the white paper is, is finished. So I don't know, Kevin, if you want to share the white paper, um, you know, with people in the document section or give them a link as to where they can get it. 
And so is the executive summary, which is just a 12-page version. Um, sorry, Kevin, I cut you off. As you were saying something? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat box, and it is, and it'll be down in the in the description in the YouTube video. Great. And then, um, and then, if I if I keep going, you know, I'm not sure, Kevin, if you want to talk through this a bit, but you know, we're really quite excited now with the white paper being done, the website being done, the KYC, the company set up in Malta, which is one of the top you know crypto jurisdictions, and and ensuring that everything we do is legally compliant. It's all done now. We, we're ready to rock and roll and, and go to market. Do you want to talk about Bounty Hive, please, Kevin? Absolutely, I can. So in, in terms of building out the community, we'll be using Bounty Hive, which is a, a bounty campaign website. And we are looking for that to go live by the weekend. And what that is for is for people who want to create content, who want to look at assisting in translating, who want to share on social media, uh, on Reddit, on Bitcoin Talk. So Bounty Hive, there'll be a bounty program where people can earn wealthy tokens in order to uh, perform some tasks. And we're really excited because we have quite a few thousand people who we've got waiting in the wings uh, in order to, to get this done so that we can really start growing our community even further, further out from those who understand real estate to those that have only ever dreamed of real estate and now actually are going to be able to participate. I've also put a link in the chat box uh, of the video of the Wealthy Coin, which really shows you our whole ecosystem and how it all comes together in terms of the process. I also shared two documents for you. And this is the bigger picture of, of how it all comes together. And I think the thing that most people don't understand is that you've got the Wealthy Exchange and Wealth Migrate plugs in with the Wealthy Exchange, but we can also work with platform partners, private equity companies, crowdfunding sites, private equity, real estate funds, you know, generally all the people out there that are going to need access to the latest technology and, you know, KYC and third party integration and AML and smart contracts, etc. And then all our GIDS functionality, et cetera. So this is a high-level overview of where we're going over the, over the next five years. And then um, in terms of the use of funds, this is all now in the white paper. I think it's very important for people if you want to understand how we're doing it. We have used the Statue of Liberty on purpose because the Statue of Liberty sound, you know, stands for democracy for people. We decide, you know, we believe it's time for democracy of wealth in terms of where things are actually going. And you can see here the different steps of what's happening. As we go higher and higher up uh, the statue of, of wealth, as we were calling it, you know, it, we get closer and closer to the ultimate goal, which is solving the wealth gap and, and empowering a billion people. And, um, and then just in terms of the timing, again, this is in the white paper, but we effectively go into the, uh, you know, the PPS will we'll go through until the end of March. We go into the PS in the 4th of April and we go into the, um, you know, the, the crowd sale effectively. Uh, closing out on May the 21st. So, you know, just from a timing perspective in terms of, you know, where everyone is, the, the, the day has finally arrived. And to finish off, to, to show you um, some things that are interesting, I put this article, so from Inc. Magazine, it came out a couple of days ago. I've actually put it in your, um, in the chat box. So for those of you watching the recording, click below. And um, it's the nine industries that are going to get impacted the most by blockchain. The first one is the banking industry. The second one is the real estate industry. I was talking to someone on Monday night um, who has a friend who is selling their $2 billion company and taking all the money and only investing in blockchain companies and blockchain specifically related to real estate. And the other thing, the reason that they wanted to connect with us was because of the wealth gap. They, they truly believe that this can solve uh, the wealth gap in terms of where it's going. So a reminder, next week is, a, you know, will be the final webinar with, uh, with David. And it'll be all around blockchain and the impacts that blockchain is going to have and where it's going. And, you know, also for those of you that are in South Africa, the live events on the 24th of March, the 27th of March in Cape Town, so 24th of March in Johannesburg, 27th of March in Cape Town, 28th of March in Durban. And then for our wealth partners, you know, I really recommend that you come to this. Um, we, we've had uh, very good feedback from the last one we did with Willem van der Post. And, you know, this will be a unique experience. They won't be recorded. 
if you're not there, you won't, you won't get the information. And, you know, we tend to say these are the off the record conversations um, in terms of, you know, going, going into the deep, you know, the deep understanding. So um, that's all from my side, Kevin. I know you had a bunch of questions, which, um, which I'd like to go back to. Do you want to, do you want to fire? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, you know, it, it really is exciting that we, you know, are heading right uh, into the, into the, I guess, the storm now, which is going to be super exciting. So if, if, if we look at the questions that, that uh, everyone's asking tonight, they're a bit of a mix between some, um, some sort of more blockchain and, and, and uh, crypto face questions. And then some people asking questions around, um, what we spoke about tonight in terms of, you know, the future and poverty and, 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 and that. So uh, you, you can also, I mean, keep the questions coming if you have any questions, but we'll start with um, this question from Carl, which just says, um, how, how is the blockchain going to be used in the future, given that many jobs are going to disappear? So, um, Bitcoin uh, is the first application of uh, this wonderful new invention that is blockchain uh, that introduces really something that we were completely unable to do. Blockchain enables us to have a shared understanding of truth without being forced to trust each other or a central third party. We can agree on a truth uh, without knowing each other and without being forced to trust each other. This is totally new. This has never existed in the history of civilization. Now, Bitcoin is a cool application uh, for payments, for uh, as a store of wealth. Um, smart contracts are introducing a completely new kind of application and what will happen in the um, future with with uh, uh, broader and broader applications of blockchain is that basically we will be able to start very precisely measuring things that were unmeasurable before and this is going to, by itself, create an incredible uh, wealth opportunity because if you don't measure something, you are not able to attribute value to it. And if you don't attribute value to it, you are not creating a market for it. Um, and, and, you know, simple things. Today, we are not measuring everything that we are calling waste. That is the very definition of our ignorance. If you look at nature, there's no waste. Everything gets recycled. For us, recycling is an incredible chore in those cities where, you know, recycling and separating rubbish is, is uh, a legal obligation. What is going to happen is that smart robots, the Internet of Things, and many other technologies together with blockchain are going to come together and will transform the entire concept, waste will uh, disappear. And for example, our homes will finance themselves by the very act of us living in them um, and, 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 and generating secondary resources that are going to be measured, valued, and, 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 and marketed. So this is just one example. And there will be thousands, just as 30 years ago, what was the internet used for? Email. That was the only thing. And today, we have thousands of different ways that the internet is used. Yeah, absolutely. Kevin, while you're asking uh, q and I'm just going to chuck up a couple of polls uh, just to get people's opinions. Uh, so please okay, answer no. the polls. It just, uh, just gives us a bit of clarity of what you're thinking. But uh, I don't want to interrupt you and David. Great. Um, there's, there's, there's two questions here that, that, that are fairly similar, one from Khotso and one from uh, Margie, which sort of are around poverty, poverty eradication. Um, you know, how, it's just saying, how, how is this 
all going to help a sort of poverty-stricken country. Um, um, so, I have a fairly radical view of poverty. Um, it is almost always imposed by a broken society that is unable to boost itself and to create opportunities for the individuals to uh, flourish. Um, it is really heartbreaking because everywhere, by definition in the world, where people are living, there is an incredible support system. There is air to breathe, there's water to drink, there is uh, uh, a ground to, to build upon, and there are brains that are as good as any other brain. So given this uh, starting point, uh, the, the, the differences that are sometimes so dramatic are created by people. Um, wars, corruption, conflict, exploitation, um, and eliminating them creates incredible starting points. You know, do not start a war, uh, whether interstate war, that is luckily less and less frequent, or a civil war. Um, do not uh, accept corruption uh, as an individual and as a, as, as a society. Um, do not uh, let exploitation uh, thrive in, in, in silence. And if you do some of these things held by transparency, accountability, uh, sometimes even civil disobedience, if necessary, um, then you are really uh, setting up the stage for, for people to say, well, uh, now I can, I can spring into action and I can care for my children and, 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 and uh, let them achieve and myself achieve things that we have always dreamt of. They can be modest things, set up a corner store, set up a, a food truck, set up a, a, a little service for, you know, uh, doing chores or, or, or whatever else. And within a generation, poverty will be eliminated. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And, and that, that sort of uh, is, is, is quite a good... Uh, intro to the question that Francine asked, she, she said, um, David, you spoke of a network society. How does this actually work? I mean, you, you, I know that that's something you're, you're quite passionate about. So, you know, how do you go about making it work or setting it up? Yeah, yeah of course, of course. So uh, when Churchill said that democracy is the worst kind of government except every other kind, uh, we laughed. And for 70 years, we pretended that it wasn't a challenge. It is a challenge, a challenge to deeply analyze whether uh, an alternative is possible. Because uh, it is pretty uh, obvious that uh, you can uh, close your eyes and ears, uh, make some symbols on a piece of paper, and then cross your fingers, and somebody will be elected as your representative, and for the next four or five years, whatever it is, they will do a perfect job. Well, obviously, it is not going to be perfect. Sometimes this is not going to be good at all. Oftentimes, they will care for more for themselves than not for the community that they are supposed to represent. Um, the starting point for a network society uh, and its potential political implications uh, beyond social implications is to understand that the technological basis is there to uh, understand how people can care for their interests, those of their family and those of their community in a manner that uh, interconnects people 
on a non-exclusive basis that is non-geographical, non-local. This is why people who are in Johannesburg or Cape Town or New York or Paris often resonate with the same needs and the same challenges. Very different from the needs and the challenges of just, you know, 50 kilometers out of a city and 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 it is easier for them to communicate and to organize among themselves and through new technolo technological platforms and and through the blockchain uh, these interests can be economically connected and can be transformed into social and political organizations. Now, this goes a little bit beyond the scope of this webinar. Uh, it is part of a thousand year plan that uh, uh, is part of a, of a master plan that, uh, that will be online on our website uh, for, for all of our participants to, to comment and to criticize and to, to passionately argue about. And as I said before, it is gonna be imperfect, uh, but, it will enable experimentation and participation in an inclusive manner. Yeah. Um, Andile said, you guys are talking about jobs disappearing. What do you think, which jobs are going to go first? Well, um, so first of all, I am not talking about jobs disappearing. Uh, that is a very myopic view of an economy seen as a closed system. The economy is not a closed system. It is an open system built on human creativity and ingenuity. If my job disappears, I will not stop saying, oh my God, now I have to die. I am gonna invent something. I have gone personally through at least a dozen jobs already, if not more. Um, I am practically unemployable in the sense that I would not be able to work in a, you know, in a large company as a middle manager, pushing paper from one place to another, uh, waiting for a computer to do what I do much better than I would ever. Uh, and, and I am recommending every member of my teams to become similarly unemployable, because if they accept doing things, that computers and robots can do, they will be replaced. But if they automate themselves out of a job, they will create an unending series of opportunities of human thriving and professional success because that capacity of automating yourself out of a job is itself precious because it means that you are able to analyze and organize resources that have required something that is uh, extremely precious, a human, and now you can do it without. But, you know, uh, supermarket cashiers and, uh, and uh, many, many, you know, taxi drivers, truck drivers, there are many, many professions uh, hamburger flipping, um, so much that miners, do you really think that a human being should be toiling in a mine uh, as, as, as his or her profession? I don't think that is what uh, uh, somebody going in a kindergarten would answer you if you ask them, uh, hello, Kitty, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? Oh, I want to be underground in the dark uh, uh, eight, 10 hours a day, every day. Or, oh, I want to drive a truck uh, uh, away from my family uh, weeks uh, on end. Uh, that is what I want to do when I grow up. Most of the jobs that are going to be gone will be happy for them to disappear. Nobody uh, is... is uh, 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 no, nobody uh, will weep for those jobs to, to have gone. What matters is to manage the transition because there are millions of truck drivers. It is the most 
uh, um, frequent job in practically every state in the United States. Truck driver, taxi driver, and, and the median age is uh, over 50. So if you tell them, oh, it's not a problem, you can always uh, become a JavaScript programmer or uh, you can go into blockchain, well, many of them will have a hard time. That is why uh, enabling as many as, as we can to realize that they are not powerless is, is so important. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and Barbara just asks, you know, she's got kids in high school, you know, thinking about university, you know, what should they study? You know, what, what should they it's not hard. Stay, stay clear of? It's hard. The, the, the problem, the reason why it's hard, because the university system has been designed for a static world and it is unable to teach skills that are useful in the workplace. They are not preparing for a profession. Rather than preparing for a profession, they are social signaling. If you go to a workplace and you say, oh, I've got this, this diploma, the workplace will not say, oh, that's great because then you will be so efficient from day one in what we need you to do. That is not the point. The workplace will say, okay, you have been uh, persistent enough to suffer through four or five years of university so that you got the degree. So probably we are going to be able to tell you what you do and you will do it. Because for the poor, po past four or five years, other people told you what to do and you did it, right? Mm. And, 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 and that is not uh, what is needed in today's uh, um, environment, um, unfortunately. So uh, the more flexible uh, the, uh, the education system, actually even better, the more flexible the learning, which is what you do rather than other people doing it to you, uh, the better uh, uh, young people are going to be prepared to the challenges that they will unavoidably face rather than saying, oh, now I got my diploma and I deserve a job. That's it. I must be guaranteed a job because I've got my diploma. That, that, is, that is meaningless in more and more societies to the point where in America there is a trillion dollars of outstanding student debt that cannot even be bankrupted away that earns uh, interest every year and a lot of people are never going to be able to pay it off. And, yeah. and that is the measure of the uselessness of a degree that doesn't lead to, um, to, to, to a professional success. Yeah. The, the last question I've got here from Richard, unless anybody else has any further questions, do quickly uh, Put them in we don't have that much time left but the question is so by the sounds of things the entire world is going to be based on the blockchain is this true should i get involved now um i think you have answered a part of that already but so so um it doesn't matter whether we call it blockchain or bitcoin uh, the, the ter terms and and uh, the infrastructure itself is going to evolve so rapidly because it is all open source 20 years ago when uh, um, I would go to Silicon Valley to meet a new team uh, of a startup, uh, they would share with me very secretly a sacred document, maybe with a non-disclosure, 20, 30 pages of the, the plans of what the startup would want to do for the next several years. And that would be called their business plan. And today, we don't call it a business plan. We put a white paper. It is openly shared. Everybody goes on criticizing it. Others get inspired by it. And they are busy doing better than what they just read a few months ago. And this hyper evolution of business models is exhilarating. So the uh, speed with which is, this is going to spread is so fast that Silicon Valley is now way behind the curve. I was just uh, at a conference in uh, San Francisco or Palo Alto, actually, in the heart of Silicon Valley, and the locals didn't even show up. Everybody was from all over the world, and the locals are still sleeping. 
Silicon Valley is asleep at the wheel. And, and we are uh, going to, 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 to change the world, for sure. Uh, uh, today, uh, if uh, uh, I'm at a, uh, uh, in, in, in a new city and I want to find a restaurant, this is how I see the world, through my phone. And if 10, 20 years ago I would have told you that every restaurant or pizzeria will have a, an internet presence, that would be crazy uh, to say. But similarly, uh, every business model 20 years from now will be blockchain-based and, and tokenized. And it would be crazy to think otherwise. Uh, if, if somebody will start a business that it is not blockchain-based and it's not tokenized, uh, the, the question will be, what's wrong? Why you want to be as invisible in the world economy as a pizzeria today that is not on Google Maps or not on Yelp? Yeah. Absolutely. But guys, listen, I, uh, I really want to thank you for your time. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. I'm conscious of, uh, of your time, David, as well. And uh, we've got... Uh, you know, we've got one final webinar on the 14th of March that, uh, you know, if people want to bring their questions or send them to Kevin, they can. Uh, Kevin's details are up there. If they want uh, more details around the Wealthy Coin, you know, then, uh, then you know, contact us. And or go to wealthy.io and you can get all the details of what's happening. And most importantly, you know, come and engage. Uh, we're all in Puerto Rico next week, which is the uh, becoming one of the crypto capitals of the world. So it's going to be a fascinating week with most of the people in this space. Um, you know, going to Puerto Rico next week. And then the week after that, as I said, I managed to bribe uh, David and his wife to come to South Africa. And the way I did that was by, uh, you know, uh, using the Big Five, which is the, uh, the the big attraction for Africa. So, you know, this is a very unique opportunity to come and uh, meet him face to face and, and learn from him, ask questions. And for the Wealth Partners, you know, I really encourage you not to miss the dinners uh, in terms of what we're doing uh, with David. So. Yeah, I think from, from everyone, David, thank you very much for your time. You know, for everyone online tonight, thank you very much for participating and asking such wonderful questions. And uh, Kevin, thank you for setting it up and running it and, and also, you know, the uh, managing all the, the questions and everything you've done tonight and, and the whole uh, managing the whole Wealthy campaign. Thank you for everything you do. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Um, we will be coming from... Uh, Puerto Rico and yeah, it's very exciting. Thanks very much. Last words from you, David. Well, I am uh, really excited to be coming, uh, not only to see the Big Five, but uh, also to see <laughs> Scott and Kevin and everybody else. Uh, uh, I have had the pleasure of meeting you in person already uh, all over the world from Tokyo to, to Las Vegas, but uh, to be uh, in your home base uh, and meeting all the wealth partners uh, in uh, Cape Town, uh, Johannesburg, and uh, there is a third city. Remind me. Durban. Durban. Okay, Durban. Thank you very much. Uh, that will be uh, really, really wonderful and a, and a pleasure. And I'm absolutely looking forward to continue our interactions and these passionate discussions. I believe they are very, very important, and I hope that uh, everybody will find them as valuable as, as I do. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, good night, everyone, for being online, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. And most importantly, have a smile on your face. I believe technology is going to change the world. It can solve some of the greatest challenges, and we hope that you're on the right side of the curve. So well done for being online. Good night. Yeah, thanks. Good night.